And it is into that resurrection that we are all united when we come to faith in Christ and where we lay down our lives, we die with him, we are buried with him, and we rise again with him. And what a beautiful way of worshiping and expressing that truth we have this year in seeing those who indeed plunged into the very tomb of Christ and rose again and were anointed thereafter with the Holy Chrism as testimony to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit and his manifold gifts. You know, we live in a world in which identity is a big deal, right? Everyone today is asked to find their identity. It used to be that identity was a kind of give. You were born into a particular family, maybe into a particular nation, a particular culture, maybe even a particular sex or orientation, all these things which now have become matters of negotiation, of deliberation, and have put upon many people today a great deal of anxiety. How do I work out who I am? There's nothing to rely on. Not even the things I was told as a child have any relevance. I'm told to go out into the world and choose my own adventure, choose my own path, and work out who I am. And even if this seems more confusing than ever, it was ever thus. That human beings, when they looked back to where they came from, their point of origin, whether that's biologically or in their family and their culture, whether it's in the psychology of how they grew up, it was always a struggle to work out who they were, who we are. But what happens in this service, what happens in this liturgy, what happens in this feast is something altogether different. Because what it does is it says that all that, as interesting as it might be, but as anxiety-ridden as it probably is, can be set aside. Because we die to all those considerations. For those who are born of the flesh are born anew, born again in Christ, born no longer of biology or culture or psychology or ethnicity or any other such consideration, but born of God, born of the Holy Spirit. And today we see that for all of you. We see that no longer are you connected to where you came from. You can keep that as a memory, as a history, as a backstory indeed, but no longer living from the past, but living from the end of all things, because you have died to yourselves and you have taken on Christ. All those who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and that, dear brothers and sister, is your new identity. That is who you are. And it carries with it enormous privilege. Because when our Lord himself descended into the Jordan and came out from his own baptism, he heard the words of the Father saying to him, This is my beloved Son. And that is the nature of your identity now. Don't wonder who you are. Don't wonder what's to become of you, what your purpose is. There's only one thing to keep in mind. That is the Father's voice that calls you his beloved. The Father loves you. That's the only identity and purpose you will ever need. It's the only kind of humanity you need ever assume. 
It comes with that as an enormous privilege, but also the responsibility to live up to that. Because you are no longer children of the past, children of this passing away age, but of the life of the age to come. Every time you come to this place, every time you come forward now, and you receive divine communion, the holy body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as tokens of the fact that you have died with him and have been raised with him. Every time you do that, you do so in the kingdom, at the end of all things, as saints, as holy ones. That is your identity, the beloved of the Father and the perfect, the made whole, the made complete, the made truly human in the end. Every divine liturgy takes place as the banquet of the kingdom, not in this present life, not here and now, but at the end of all things. Later on, you will hear me invite people forward. The holy things are for the holy, for the saints. And first, among everyone here, you will come forward today to receive Holy Communion, because in that moment, you are already seen by the Father, not only as beloved, but as perfect. And we go out from this place, obviously, to contend with a world that does a number of different things to us. First of all, it wants to drag us back into all those other considerations. It wants to see you as the product of where you've come from, your families of origin, your cultures, your history, all the stuff that you've done before, all the stuff that died in that form. And people will want to see you through that lens. They will want to continually pull you back to that. Not just people who are accustomed to doing certain things with you, certain habits, but people who will want to see you as they see everyone as just simply the sum total of everything they've come from in their lives. And you must resist. That's the responsibility of being the beloved. You must set that aside. You must turn again and again your minds back to this font and to this holy chrism. And you must remember again and again the voice of the Father saying, you are the beloved and you are perfect in my eyes, in my sight. And you will be able therefore and thereby to resist those who want to drag you back into that other way of looking at the world. When you go out from this place too, you will have to live with a world that is yet seemingly under the control of the authorities of this passing away age. Seemingly Caesar still holds sway. Yes, Jesus died, buried, and risen, and ascended even to the heavens, and yet it doesn't always seem like it out there. In fact, there are few moments when it will seem clear that it is so. But you have been given eyes that have been fashioned anew today. You have put on Christ, and the eyes of God in you will enable you to see that even though it doesn't appear so, that all power in heaven and on earth has been given to the Lord Jesus. He, not Caesar, rules. He, not Caesar, is sovereign over all things. And although Caesar and all his counterfeit powers of this age appear for now to hold sway, they have been truly emptied of all power. And what has yet to be revealed to the whole world, you have the opportunity to see already. You have the opportunity to experience already. You have the opportunity to live already. If you live up to this font and to this chrism, and you live up to the participation in the holy and divine body and blood of Christ, you will be already citizens of the very end of all things. You will be kingdom bearers and kingdom builders in this world. And wherever there is anything that opposes that kingdom, you will act. You will see and you will act and you will bring the grace of Christ 
and his sovereign love and power into that situation. And you will be those who begin now to live God's future. That future which is assured, which Christ's resurrection is the down payment of, which his ascension is the true sign of, and which his second and glorious coming will be the fulfillment of. You are his ambassadors. You have put on Christ and you represent Christ to everyone in the world. There are those who will look at you having known nothing of that having not experienced one moment of God's grace or love or justice in this troubled world. People who only know Caesar, who only know this passing away age and all the problems in it. There are many people out there, they carry injustices, they carry trauma, they carry the, the scars on their backs from every oppressive power. But you will come to them as kingdom bearers and Christ bearers and you will offer something of God's future kingdom, and you will transform them, and you will invite them, and they will know something of what God's future is like here and now. It's a high degree of privilege to be the beloved of the Father. It's a high degree of responsibility to be the beloved of the Father. But you are not left without resources. You have the grace of the Holy Spirit that indwells you. You have the gifts of the Holy Spirit that empower you. And you have, having been born anew, not of the flesh, but of the will of God, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, you have a new family. You have new brothers and sisters. A family that is here, present for you, praying for you, supporting you a place where you can turn, a place where you belong above all other places. And added to that, you have the whole company of all the saints from every age and every place of the church, all those who gather at every divine liturgy. You are now in communion with all of them, from the call of Abraham and the, all the righteous of the old covenant through to all the prophets apostles and martyrs of the new covenant. They are your brothers and sisters. Count on them, rely on them, pray for them as we pray for you. And so, beloved of God the Father, we welcome you with joy, with brightness of this great and holy feast. And we ask that you continue to be those who live up to that great calling of being beloved of God himself. Amen.